planet that would be uh, helpful for you to get. So please uh, consider that. Pray for me. I've had this sinus issue, swelling in my sinus cavity. My jaw is still sore. I feel like I've been kicked by a mule uh, in my jaw. And it hurts every time I talk, so we may, we may beat the Baptist to the buffet today. So uh, pray for me, and I love you all. And let's stand, and let's get our mind ready to worship the King. Lord, we just welcome you here this morning. You're so good. The Lord's good, amen. We're going to worship the King this morning. You're so, so, so worthy, Father. We're here to exalt your name, God. To sing with us this morning. You are so, so good, Father. Let the King of my heart be the mountain when I run. The fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good. good. Amen. Mountains are still being moved. And 
strongholds are still being loosed. Oh God, we believe it. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. All my giants are still being slain. Oh God, we believe it. And yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. that we need to move. Do what you do. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Who believe the Lord's still moving this morning? He is so, so good. You're still moving this morning. God, you're still answering our prayers this morning. You're still seeing us through our situations this morning, Father. You are still alive. You're still well. You're still answering our prayers, Father. You're still setting the captives free. You're still setting the, the broken God fixed. You are so, 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 so good, God. We just love you, Lord. We exalt, your, we exalt you this morning, God. We praise you this morning, Father. We love you so much, Father. We just love you so much, God. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing this with us. All my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. And all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You've been close like no And I have lived in the goodness of God, yeah. Cause all my life you have been faithful. All my life, yeah. And all my life you have been so, so. God, we honor your goodness in this place this morning. We, where would we be without the goodness of God? Hopelessly lost. 
that you've been so good to us. You've been so good to me. And every day, your goodness is brand new with your mercy. My days are not always good, but you, God, are always good. Help me learn that. That my circumstances have nothing to do with your character. You're a good, good Father. Worthy of our praise, our devotion, our heart. And so, Lord, as long as there's breath in these lungs, I'll use them to sing of the goodness of God. You are good to me. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We give place for you to do what you need to do in our hearts. And do it for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As our kids are um, being dismissed to their class, I want to um, I want to ask you just to remain standing with me, if you will, and turn to the Book of Psalms, chapter thirty. I want to read a few places in Scripture today and preface what I'm about to share with you. Last week, you know, the Lord changed my message and um, seems to be what he's enjoying doing right now in my life. I began on Monday working on the message for today, and I was going to preach about how we walk through loss, but I was taking it in a different, entire different angle of losing maybe um, what we, losing what we had planned and walking through what God had planned. That was the direction I was going to go. And then um, I got the news yesterday about Jack. And it's sort of a gut punch. So I um, immediately went to prayer for Libby. As, as a parent's heart, only those of you that have lost children to death know where she is right now. But in my mind, I just thought, I, you know, my, my heart can't fathom that. So God, I'm going to need you to help me understand. And the Lord so softly reminded me, Sean, you've never preached a message on grief. Though you've dealt with it your whole life. I said, that's because I'm not a professional. There's grief counselors, Lord. You know, I always have an answer for God. That I'm, I'm not licensed or I didn't take that schooling. And I'm a preacher, not a counselor. He reminded me of the preciousness of his anointing. It isn't about certificates and licensure. Now, there are things professionals can help you with that I can't. But I can certainly... Open the bread of life to give you a window into what God says about grief. And I want to do that this way. I want to be faithful to that. I wish my jaw didn't hurt. And I want to share with you what the Lord spoke to me between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. this morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy 
comes in the morning. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And the last place, 1 Kings 19.9. I spent the early morning hours with Elijah this morning in his story. Verse 9 says, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Father, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for those that are here, those that are watching. I pray you help me. You started this this morning. Help me move out of the way and deliver your word. May today the precious work of the Holy Spirit in comfort, in hope, do what only he can. We all, God, stand in this room having lost something. Someone, something precious. I'm asking for the healing balm of Gilead that you promise to pour into our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Grieving is such a, um, such a strange land to walk through. And there are people who think that grieving is just for those who have a loved one that has died. And that's just not true. We grieve a variety of losses. Grief is <clears throat> universal. It's global. There's not a person walking this planet who does not deal or have to sit at the table with grief. And what's strange is while grief is global, it's also indescribably personal. When you're walking through your grief, you know here that everybody has grief. But it's in the here that you say, God, nobody has my grief. I'm grieving, God. And I wonder if you care. Now, we don't say that out loud because we're good Christians. But our heart screams it. It hits us all. I don't care how old you are. I remember the first funeral that I can remember that I was at. I was just a kid. Probably too young to have been there. And I remember almost being able to see grief on the face of my family and friends and all these adults who just the week before were laughing and having dinner together, were in this room together, and there were tears running down everybody's cheeks, and it just felt different. It hit them all at one time, and that's what happens. It, grief begins to live in the shock wave of trauma. Trauma is defined as a disorder 
a disordered psychic or behavioral state resulting from severe mental or emotional stress or physical injury. That's the definition of trauma, but if you've lived it, you know it's way more than a mechanical word. It's something you didn't see coming, and it hits you like a ton of bricks. It's almost like you're dazed. You, you, you hear people asking questions, but it's not that you just don't have the answers, but you really don't care if you do answer. Everything's blurry. It's just, what happened? Yesterday, it wasn't like this, and today it's totally different. I'm in trauma. I'm in shock, and people mean well, and they come, and they pat you on the shoulder, and they pat you on the knee, and they tell you, I'm praying for you, and everything's going to be okay, and you know God's with you, and you hear that, and you know that, but in the moment, you don't even feel like you can speak. I'm hit with that. It's that moment when you're having to make decisions about colors of caskets. When you thought you'd be planning your next vacation spot. Or a family dinner. I've walked with so many people into the funeral home and the funeral director, and and, and I thank God for our local funeral homes and directors and, and Rogers here, he does a great job down here at Hallers and I've, I've been in that room in that moment when people say the funeral director will talk about, you know, the color and the fabric of the inside of the casket and, and w- do you want gold or wood and all these. And I think in all of these questions in this moment, how in the world can we function? Their whole world is turned upside down. We want them to pil- pick silk or linen. I've stood there with more families than... You can imagine, and I've stood there myself. I've stood there with my grandparents and my great-grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles. And just three years ago next month, I stood there looking over my stepdad for what would be the last time I would see him on this side of time. And I remember those feelings that we don't talk about. Let me tell you what they were. My heart was telling me, Sean, you want to remember every detail of his face. Because when that lid closes, you won't see him till heaven. And so I remember looking over and trying to remember the shape of his nose. It's so weird. I want to remember the lines on his face and how his crow's feet dotted the corners of his eyes. And at the same time, I'm trying to remember every detail, my heart was screaming to me, Sean, you don't want this to be your last memory. I had a fight with myself at the casket. Grief is born out of that. Grief is defined as a deep and poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement. Semicolon, second definition, a deep sorrow. It's what you do when you feel a loss. You can try, but you just can't skip grief. People will tell you, well, you know, there just comes a time when you got to get over it. I hate that. No, you don't. Grief isn't something you get to skip. It's natural. It's God-given. It's wired into us. Grief is healthy. It's needed. I know we all want to skip it. I want to skip it. I've wanted to skip it, but we just can't just skip over it. I'm reminded of when I was a kid in elementary school and we would play duck, duck, goose. I know they don't play that much anymore, but because somebody would get offended because it wasn't a duck. But I remember we played duck, duck, goose, and everybody sat in a circle. Did anybody else play duck, duck, goose as a kid? And you go around and touch the back of the head, right, in a circle. Duck, 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 duck. And whenever you knew you were getting to the person you were going to call a goose, you would stretch out your leg, duh, goose, and take off running. But you just had to be smarter than the game. You don't pick fast kids. All fast kids are ducks. Slow kids are ones with a minor injury or geese. And I feel like when it comes to grief, we've almost been built to duck, duck, goose grief. 
I'm not going to pick that. I don't want to walk through that. I don't want the, the pain of that. But if you, if you don't deal with grief, grief will deal with you. I've read a lot of C.S. Lewis books. He's one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called A Grief Observed. It's a hard book. I wouldn't recommend it for bedtime reading. But he said a quote in there, and it's always stuck with me. He said, no one ever told me that grief feels so much like fear. And he goes on to talk about the fear of being alone. And he goes on in that book to make several cases, but he comes down to three, to three sentences. God is sovereign. God is good. And I hurt. And all three of these are true at the same time. And that's hard for us to put our head around because if God is good and God is sovereign, I shouldn't hurt. But he would tell us that in the middle of our hurt, that's where we find that God is sovereign and God is good. When you lose anything of value, there's loss and there's grief is born. And we're good at identifying and telling everybody when every other part of us hurts. We're good at telling people when our back hurts. We're good at telling people when our leg hurts. I'm good at telling you when my knee hurts. I'm good at telling you when my jaw hurts. But you know what? We are horrible at telling people when our heart hurts. Because somehow that makes us look weak. God can't heal a heart that's not honest that it's hurt. I, I've got to be able to say, yes, I, I, have, I have a hurt heart. And let me tell you something, there's no set expiration date on grief. There's expiration dates on almost everything you bring into your home, but there's no definite date on the length of grief. But in that journey, in that walk, there is hope. This is where my preacher side kicks in. Hope finds its resiliency in the very middle of grief. You don't move on from grief. You move forward in grief. That's your point for today. And, and I feel like that the Lord was sharing with me that you, you move forward in grief by putting on the shoes of hope. Grief is, is too painful. It's too hard to walk this path barefoot. It'll hurt you too much to walk in your own strength and your own ability. You have to put on the shoes of hope. Listen, grief changes you. It's in that place of deep grief that hope begins to shine. And in that moment, you have to make the decision of who you are. Am I going to walk this out with hope or am I going to walk it out with hopelessness? Again, this is not just losing a loved one in death. There are people in this room that have lost a lot, lost with your children and lost with relationships and lost with, with a dream. Something, something like that has happened to you and you're walking through this grief. There comes a point where you have to choose, I will either walk in hope or I will walk in hopelessness. But that choice is yours in the middle of grief. And the enemy will convince you to doubt the light of hope. The devil will tell you that it's so dark what you're walking through, there's no possible way even God could light this up. It's too heavy. It's too dark. It's too, it's too deep. And by the way, if God really cared about you, you wouldn't be in this darkness in the first place. This is something God can't help you with. Let go of that light of hope. This is your reality that you're stuck with. But I'm telling you that in John 1, 5, Jesus wrote through the pen of John something so wonderful for you and I to hear that light came into the darkness and that it shines in the darkness. And here's what he said, and the darkness does not comprehend it. I've told you before, that's a poor translation of that sentence. It does not say that the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. It says the darkness cannot overcome. Overcome the light. I want you to hear what the devil will never let you in on. There is not a darkness deep enough that God cannot light it up. There is not a grief that is heavy enough that the light of hope can't walk into the middle of it. And hell can bring everything it has to stop it. But John 1.5 lets us know that as much as hell would rage against it, the light will overcome the darkness every single time. The darkness cannot overcome the light. You can trust that light because there's not a grief big enough or a loss dark enough to swallow the light. Well, Pastor, what is that hope? I am happy to announce to you and to my heart this morning, Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the light. 
He comes with promises. Did you know that? Hope walks into the valley of your grief with a promise. What's that promise? To trade your ashes for beauty. Our ashes. Things we used to hold on to. Things we used to be able to look at and say, this is mine. I'm in love with this. I love this. This is something that's mine. God said there'll come a day when all that you used to hold on to will be ashes in your hand. In the darkness of the valley of grief with those ashes, what do you do? God comes in to make a trade. It's beyond our ability to to do it. It's beyond our ability to understand it. That's why, hear me, in darkness, is it is easier just to lay down in hopelessness. That's why you feel pulling at you at the hardest moments when there's a death, when there's grief, when there's loss, loss of a job, loss of your health, loss of a friendship, loss of a relationship, loss of a loved one. Hopelessness will build you a bed in the darkness. And will tell you to take a load off and just stay here. Just lay down right here. It will even try to convince you that the light is an annoyance. You need the light to be gone so you can lay here in the dark and be still. The darkness, this is your point, the darkness wants to put periods where hope is ready to walk in with a comma. The enemy would like you to die in your grief. To put a period on your life to say this is this this is as far as God could help her. This is as far as God could carry him. And hold you up like a trophy to hell. But God repeatedly walks in with a light. This will not be your end. This is a comma in your life. And it's a comma you didn't want and it's a comma you didn't see coming, but it is a comma. And if you'll grab a hold of the light, you will walk through this. We deal with these dark moments personally. We deal with them collectively. Y'all listen to me. Right now, I believe that hell is putting a heave together to collectively send us into hopelessness. All this stuff you see playing out on the news, on people's social media feeds, You know what it is boiled down? It is the darkness of hopelessness. How? How how has hell achieved this? I'll tell you how. He has magnified our losses and shrunk our blessings. Think of all the feelings of loss we've wrestled with and are still wrestling with. I jotted down just a few. Loss of relationships, loss of freedoms and ways, loss of confidence, loss of trust, loss of dreams, loss of trust, loss of direction, a loss of morality, a loss of basic truth, a loss through addiction, losses through sex trafficking, loss of human value. And it's caused us to lose our identity. And we're wandering in the darkness collectively as a people so that we're Divided in our hopelessness. And hell has the audacity to build us a bed. And say, lay down and quit. This is all culture will ever be. This is all society will ever be. And this is all you will ever be. This is as high as you can achieve as a white person. This is as high as you can achieve as a black person. This is as high as you can achieve as a Hispanic. Hopelessness abounds. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what ethnicity, background, stage, status, money in the bank. It does not matter. Hopelessness has built us all a bed and wants us to remain in the hell of our grief. And I'm telling you, in this moment, light breaks through every single time. And God comes walking on the dark hill as Vestal Goodman used to say and he brings the light of hope and says that may be what they say and that may be what he says and that may be what she says but I overcame death, hell and the grave and I'm walking with the light of the hope of heaven 
Hope is what I love to preach about and talk about and dream about. I'm a a recipient of hope. My life is framed by the hope of Jesus. It's what David is saying to us in the 30th Psalm that I read to you there in the beginning, that, that you make sounds and the sound is either weeping in the dark or it's shouting in the light. And we have to be truthful and admit that there's some dark weeping moments that are real. And that does not make us weak, and it does not make us faithless. It is proof that we are living. Guys, listen to me. Weeping is something we do. I sat in the living room with June when Wally made his entrance into heaven, and there was weeping. It's what we do. People say, well, if you had faith and if you had hope, you you wouldn't cry. Are you crazy? Weeping is who we are. We, we weep. We weep because it's dark. We, we weep. <laughs> we weep because a light has been snuffed out. It's, it's, God puts us right in the scripture and lets us know that it happens. It happens in dark seasons. You say, well, pastor, how long does weeping last? Well, according to Psalms 30, it endures the whole night. As long as it's dark, weeping happens. That's what it says in Psalms 30. Weeping may endure for the night. And then hope comes walking by itself in the nighttime. There's just something about finding light in the dark. There's just something about finding that light in the dark. As a kid, my grandma, my great grandma McKinney, she had a farmhouse in Carter County, Kentucky. I've talked about her farm. It's uh, it was a huge farm. It was an old farmhouse, old old farmhouse. And I can remember I loved in the summer going up and spending the night, spring, break, summer, whatever, spending the night on that farm. Running the hills, caves, down in the creek. It, it was a great, uh, everything but her chickens. And inevitably, because it was a large, flat farm, it would storm horribly spring into summer. And it's an old farm in Carter County, and I, I think, I don't know how they got electric to it, but it must have been on thread. Because every time it stormed, I, I mean, all I had to do was blow a grasshopper into it and electric go out. It wasn't, stra- it wasn't strong. It wasn't a stout electric. And I slept upstairs in the farmhouse in the little back left corner in a bedroom. And I can remember being up there, and I thought it was so cool because I had that window mason to look out over all the farm. I used to imagine I was the owner of everything, right? And as a kid, I can remember that storm would come, and I would hear it rumbling in the distance, and I knew it was coming. And I just knew the electric was going to go out. And even though you're sleeping in the dark, everybody knows it's different when the electric's out. It's a different dark. And that wind started blowing. I heard it against the house. And then here came the storm. Lightning flashing through the window. Thunder crashing. It was raining so hard it'd strangle a frog. And I remember, boom, pop, the electric would go out. And it's scary because the only bathroom is downstairs and everybody else is downstairs. And you're up in this attic of this old farmhouse built in the 1800s all by yourself in the pitch black. As a kid. (laughs) That builds character. And what I learned was that no matter how dark it went and no matter what time the electric went out, my granny was Johnny on the spot. I would listen for it. You know what I was listening for? The creak of those old farm steps. As granny would begin to rise up the steps. Now she was slower than cream rising to the top of buttermilk. But she was coming up. And she had a flashlight or a lantern. And I began to hear those steps creaking. And I knew granny was on the way. And light was coming. And she would begin to call out to me. Honey, don't worry. Granny's coming with a light. And as she would come up and make the top of the ascent of the stairs because it cooked around to a little back room corner on the left, as she would come to the top of those stairs, whether it was flashlight or coal or lantern, when that light would hit the top mount of the stairs, it would hit off of that wall and begin to glow a little bit in my bedroom. And I knew light was on the way. I remember how much that comforted me when Granny would walk in with a light. My kids, I wanted to do the same. I wanted to provide the same for them. And when we lived over on Barnhart, we had a horrible storm. The electric went out, and my kids were little. And I remember they just shot up as soon as the electric went out and screamed their guts out. And it was dark, and it was scary, and there was lightning going everywhere. And I wasn't like Granny. I didn't have a flashlight right by the bed or a lantern, but I knew where it was. 
So I had to get up and walk through the hall to get it. And the whole time me and Andrew are calling, hang on, hang on, just stay where you are. Mom and dad are fine. We're going to get a light. And I'm walking through and I step on Legos and everything else that's going on. And I finally find it. And I'm coming in walking through pain ha, ha, with the light. Somehow it didn't look like Granny's, you know, Norman Walkwell moment. But I was there, held them in the light. And i got to tell you that God is the same. It, it, we've got to get this in our head, and more than our head, our heart, our spirit, that dark times are coming, storms are coming, and the electric of your soul will go out. But God will faithfully climb the stairs to where you are and bring the light in the darkest of rooms. He'll walk through Legos. He'll walk through troubles. He'll walk through walls to get to where you are. Isn't that what we sing in that song? There's no shadow. He won't light up. No mountain. He won't climb up coming after me. That's what he does. He walks in the dark with the light. Light. And Elijah, Elijah is feeling the pain of darkness. It's overwhelming. He's convinced he's lost something. What? He's lost his purpose, his dream, his direction, his value. Jezebel said, in 24 hours you'll be dead. Weeping comes in those moments. It endures. Weeping is a reality. It's okay to weep. Jesus wept, shortest of all verses. He wept at a peculiar time at the tomb of Lazarus, even though he knew he was about to raise him from the dead. He still wept. It's the humanity of us. Here's your last point. Weeping and hope live together in unbelievable moments. It's when the darkness begins to transition into the day. When you're at your darkest in grief, the boldest move you make is to reach out a trembling hand and grab the light of hope. You know what hope does? It transitions you from darkness to day. It trades your ashes for beauty. In that same verse in Isaiah, he says, I don't just trade your ashes for beauty. I'll trade your heaviness for dancing. Let me tell you what I get out of that, what God spoke to me this morning. In the middle of the darkest part of your grief, God can teach you a new dance. That only grief can be the instructor for. When you've suffered loss... And you come into the house of God and begin to worship and praise. It is different. You feel Job's vibe then. What? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. People say, how can you walk through that? Well, I'm not just walking. God's teaching me a new dance. Well, don't you need a partner to dance with? Don't you need somebody? Oh, friends are great. They're fine. But I have a dance partner from heaven. It's the hope of Jesus dances with me. And so you, I may look silly to you when I sashay across the kitchen. I may look silly to you when I twirl myself in my living room and you say, what is wrong with them? They've lost their mind. No, I've picked up a new dance. I've learned how to dance in the dark. I, I, I've learned how to to live in the darkness of this grief because I have, I have hope. Don't let heaviness define your season. Let the beauty of a new dance define your season. And when you walk with hope, you know that it's a walk. It's a journey. you got to learn the steps of this new dance in this season. And let me just give a couple things that I've lived through that I wanted to share with you. The first is if you're walking through grief, please hear this. If you hear nothing else about what I want you to do, be patient with you. Don't rush you. Hold on to the light of hope, but be patient with you. How patient? The Lord showed me this picture, and it's so beautiful. He said, Sean, do you remember when your babies were learning how to walk? Yes. What would you do? You hold, their, you hold your fingers like this, and what do, those, what do those babies do? They grab your fingers, and they begin to toddle like this. And you're so happy, and you know what you want to do? You get somebody to sit across the room, and you do what? You say, 
walk to mommy, walk to daddy, walk to mama, nana, mimi, gigi, whatever you are, gaga, walk to them. And when you let go of that baby, what does it, it's, everybody holds their breath in that moment, right? Because the baby does this. You're like, okay, what's going to happen? And they do this, you <laughs> And what do you do? You have patience. Because they're learning how to walk. You know what the Lord said to me, June? Have patience with yourself. You're learning a new walk. You're going to toddle. You're going to stumble. There's times you're going to fall flat on your tush. Have patience. Get back up and toddle again. In grief, God doesn't come with this big command bugle and siren and say, get up and walk. No, he, as a father, puts his fingers out and says, come on, let's toddle. Let's toddle through the grief together. Death makes you analyze everything about you, who you are, why you're here, what are you accomplishing, why, who are you impacting. Death makes you refocus what matters and what doesn't matter. So be patient with you. And the second thing, reach out and touch someone's life in the middle of your grief. the hardest because we think I'm broken how in the world could I help anybody else do you know that when you want to join two pieces of material together the best way to do it is to rough up both sides two pieces of material that you want to join together bond together better if both ends are frayed You're walking through grief, find another freight end. If you're working with electric and you want to join two wires together, what do you have to do? You have to split it back and expose the wire on both sides, then join them together in a wire nut. In the middle of your grief, you know what the Holy Spirit has done? He's exposed you. Find a connection with somebody who's walked it who is maybe in the middle of it, but the same darkness is on both of you. Sit and be with each other. Let God speak more than you do. But then speak to each other. Relationships are what we're wired for. Think of it. That's all that hell is trying to stop right now is relationships. Social separation, tribalism, political division, loss of civility, isolation, loneliness, feeling unworthy, unloved. If hell fights it that much, it must be important. Relationships are the treasure chest that contain hope. Science has even found now that they hire people to cuddle infants in NICUs. I thought this was an interesting article. They hire people to cuddle infants in NICUs across the world because they have found that when a human cuddles a NICU baby and that connection from skin to skin is made, it reduces stressors in the babies and it accelerates brain development and growth. You know what that tells me? When you make a connection, a relationship with somebody, it is the bridge that you help them be able to think through properly. You say, well, I don't know what to say and I wouldn't know how to help them. Can you be there? When hopelessness settled in at the tree, Elijah, he sat down, and in the middle of his grief, he said, I'm done, just end my life. That's a decision made in the dark. And let me tell you this. You should be thankful more than anything else in your life right now that God doesn't answer your declarations made in the dark. If God would have answered his decision in the dark, Elijah would have been dead. But instead, God said, no, I see you in the dark, but I'm coming with a light. And you can't miss this. <laughs> he moved from a tree to a cave in the mountain based on what God told him. He said, God, kill me, in me, it's enough. And God didn't even answer. You know what God said? You've got a journey ahead of you. 
get up and move. And he moved from a tree, a broom tree, which looks like an upside down broom, provides no shade. You go there to die. He moved from a tree to the mountain. Are you seeing it? The hope of God's word elevated him from a low position to a high position. This is the same mountain where God met Moses. You know what that tells me? God said, trauma pushed you far from me. I'm bringing you closer to my presence so I can talk to you. And he looked at him and said, what are you doing here? It's the question of, are you going to be hopeful or hopeless? Because if you're going to be full of hope, you've got to eat because the journey is still ahead of you. And I'm telling you this morning, God is shining a light in this message. I'm trying my best best with what I have to tell you that God is telling you it's not over. You've got a journey ahead of you. And here's the light you need to walk it. It's the morning star. Show me a picture of the morning star. I <clears throat> gave you that picture, Hunter. I think it's the next to last picture. The morning star. Now we know it today as the planet Venus. Before sunrise, it is the most interesting thing. It's as dusk is giving way to dawn. When the sky is still dark-ish, you can find this star. It's Venus. It's the morning star. It's the brightest star in the sky. And it comes up every morning about two to three hours before sunrise. You know what it signifies? Night is ending. The day is coming. On the hills of this star is this. Next picture. A sunrise. As long as you can look up and see that star, you know that light is about to break through. And in an interesting of all the things Jesus could have typified himself to be in the cosmos, Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, I, Jesus... Testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, and I am the bright and morning star. And that's why John closes his book with, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I am the bright and morning star, meaning what? We celebrated it three weeks ago on Easter, that in the middle of your grief, Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, when Jesus rises, when Jesus gets up, when he walks in the valley of the darkness of grief with the light of hope, you know that on the hills of Jesus is what? On the hills of Jesus is your healing. On the hills of Jesus is your strength. On the hills of Jesus is your freedom. On the hills of Jesus is your elevation. On the hills of Jesus is your life and your your purpose and your meaning and your value and your identity. And he says, I want you to know that when it is the darkest in your life, look up for the morning star. Look up for the hope of Jesus. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He's walking into the very valley where you are. Hold on to the promise. My grieving brother, my grieving sister, my, my friend Libby, who will hopefully watch this message, hold on to the promises of God. He's walking into your valley with the light of hope. Hold on, even when you're grieving, hold on. I'll end with this as they come to the music. Abraham had a great love story with his wife, Sarah. They were married between 60 and 70 years. He loved her. In Genesis 23, you can read it. Sarah dies. The love of Abraham's life dies. And the Bible says that Abraham wept and mourned for Sarah. And that word mourned in the Hebrew is sada, which means he felt like his heart was ripped from his chest. That's the Hebrew word. They're one flesh. A piece of him is ripped. She 
She died at 127 years old. Abraham would be 137 at the time. I wanted you to get in your mind this older man, weeping, mourning. His kids come to him and say, Dad, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with mom's body? We're in a strange land. We're far from home. And I want you to read this on your own time in Genesis 23. Abraham goes to the Hittites. And he asks if he can buy a burial cave. And they say, you've been so good to us, we'll give you a cave. And Abraham said, no. I will not honor my wife with anything free. I want to pay. I want to feel it. And he buys Sarah a burial cave. Guess where? In Canaan. Odd. Why would he buy a burial cave in Canaan? Because about 70 years earlier, God made him a promise. One day, Abraham, your descendants will inhabit the land of Canaan. And there they will be a blessed people. And I'll bless them more than any other nation on the face of the earth. And whoever they bless will be blessed. Now what's odd about the timing when Sarah dies is they do not own Canaan. He knows his descendants, because he's already been told this, have to endure 400 years of bondage in Egypt. But in that moment, that 137-year-old man says, in the middle of my grief, I'll hold on to the promise of God. And I'm going to bury my sweetheart right here. Because one day, her great, 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 great grandchildren will call this place home. And I want them to know that their grandpa believed God so much that we started the family cemetery on land we don't even own yet. Mm. That's holding on in grief. Today, God has promised you things that I have not promised you and that nobody else can bring to pass. I'm asking you not to let grief swallow up your promise. I've lost that dream. I've lost that relationship. I've lost my value. I've lost my purpose. I've lost my loved ones. God's word to you this morning. He's bringing the light to tell you you still have a journey ahead. Come closer to me. This morning, without a doubt, one of the hardest sermons I've ever had to deliver. But I refuse to believe somebody didn't need it. If right now you feel that you're grieving something, loss, the trauma of it. I, again, you don't have to tell me what it is. I'm grieving something. And you know hell is preparing a bed for you to lay down and quit. I would just like for you to stand right where you're at. Come on, just stand. As a point of identifying yourself with what heaven is saying right now. I'm grieving something, Pastor. I'm grieving a loss. And you don't know how hard hell has tried to get me to lay down and quit.